so we appreciate that kind invitation. And hello, everyone from Boston, Massachusetts in the USA. It's really an honor for me to be part of the APSS uh, programming. So today I'll be talking about speaking up across hierarchical gradients, overcoming the barriers. Uh, my job heading up our Departmental Quality and Safety Division includes performing root cause analyses after critical events and complications. Um, I'm just going to adjust the screen here. And um, during, during these analyses, we find that the contributing factors can be multifactorial, but almost always uh, some component has to do with a lapse in communication. So communication failures lead to sentinel events. Sadly, in most cases, somebody knew something important but did not speak up. And so speaking up is a tactic for improving patient safety and our quality of care. So despite our expertise and our best intentions, errors can still happen in large part because we're human. The same heuristics and mental shortcuts that allow us to perform quite expertly can also lead to cognitive errors and human mistakes. And much of our thinking is not really conscious and difficult to perceive and therefore uh, difficult to manage. So thus communication plays an important role in mitigating harm from inevitable errors and sharing mental models, reframing, testing of assumptions can all happen when we connect together and when decision-making becomes more of a group sport rather than an individual skill. Finally, patient safety is linked to worker safety and wellness. The quality of communication is a marker for psychologic safety and improving communication is a driver for, uh, is a driver or mechanism for improving safety culture. So this can be a problem for our trainees. It's understandable that learning in an apprenticeship way uh, at the bedside can be fraught with problems if there's a sense of hierarchy so for example, in anesthesia, as we well know, uh, there can be times where directives are given to administer medications immediately or perform interventions in a very quick um, way without any kind of long disclosure disco discourse. And so this traditional system makes it hard for trainees to speak up and to question in the moment, either for their own learning purposes or perhaps worse, to stop a potential safety misstep. So we set up a project to explore how simulation might help this challenge. And I'd love to show you how that worked out. Um, I'm going to bring, bring you around uh, in a clockwise manner around the schematic. So first at the top, we developed a simulation-based teaching intervention that was also an experiment. First, I invited 40 anesthesia trainees to come individually to our simulation center to practice management of simulated um, obstetric emergencies, for example, stat cesarean deliveries and postpartum hemorrhage. What I did not tell them is that during the simulated case, scripted actors playing the roles of surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses would start to misbehave or do or say things that might not be in the best interest of the patient. There were multiple opportunities like this for trainees to speak up to members of these different role groups. And then uh, moving around uh, in the second box, uh, on the right, we would undergo a debriefing uh, to reflect on what just happened. And during this discussion, shown at the bottom, we talked about concepts such as the importance of speaking up. And we loaded their toolboxes, if you will, with some language techniques. This included role play to practice speaking up. And I'd like to uh, show you a little bit more about what was in this concepts and practice part of the intervention. So during the debriefing, we covered the so-called two challenge rule, which has origins in the aviation industry and the military. In the cockpit, the first officer or co-pilot has the right and also the responsibility to speak up and challenge if there's a concern about the pilot's actions. And if they do not get a satisfactory response from the pilot, they have the right and responsibility to challenge again. Thus, the two challenge rule. We also introduced and practiced a language technique called advocacy inquiry, a language rubric with roots in organizational behavior and in business. It's a great way for sharing perspectives and inviting discussion. 
And when it's done well, it minimizes defensiveness in the other party. Advocacy can be a simple observation while inquiry asks for validation of that observation and also invites alternate perspectives or explanations. Uh, for example, um, so it looks like we might be flying at too low an altitude as we approach that mountain range. Are you reading the situation the same way? The second challenge can then be escalated by expressing one's personal concern about the situation. So we're now at 2,000 feet. I'm worried that we need to make an adjustment before we get uh, any closer to that mountain. Any reason why we can't start now? And really at the core of this, and personally, I think this is the most uh, difficult aspect of using advocacy inquiry, is that all the challenging needs to come from a stance of curiosity rather than a carved in stone assumption that the other person is wrong. For example, it is only with curiosity and with a willingness to question and with a desire to hear the pilot's perspective that the co-pilot could actually find out that really the pilot is aware of some energy, uh, some enemy radar ahead and that by skirting the edge of the mountain, we, um, we get life-saving coverage. And so suddenly a dumb move is actually quite brilliant. So now let's get back to the rest of the intervention and experiment. We did role play of speaking up, and then we brought the trainees back into the simulated OR for another opportunity to manage different crises and to speak up about various issues. This is shown in the orange box. So for the purposes of this study, we compared uh, language and experience one to language in the repeat simulation number two to measure the impact of the training. Let me show you how one of these simulations worked. We're going to watch a video. And first of all, let me uh, say that the resident in this film gave permission to share this film for learning purposes. When I start showing this video, we are entering near the end of the simulation. Um, he will have already done a heroic job uh, managing induction of general anesthesia in a, uh, for an emergency cesarean delivery. He will have already treated an unstable cardiac arrhythmia and managed postpartum hemorrhage. Now the patient is finally stable and the OB is starting to close. And the OB then realizes that the patient would be an ideal candidate for a research study that the doctor is doing. She wants the anesthesia resident to administer a test drug, but the only problem is that there's been no informed consent. So let's have a listen. Or to 100 milligrams of solumedrol. Mm -hmm. And I think she would be a great patient for the study. Yeah, she's got more adhesions than that last study patient. Yeah. So, um, Robert, yeah. can you go? My attache is right there. Yeah. And there's a little box with a study drug in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's like the next number on there, which I think is either 14 or 15. Oh, just a minor question. Uh, yeah. Did she sign the consent form for a drug She didn't, but it, because I didn't know she was going to have so many adhesions, but she's been my patient forever, so I'm sure she'll sign it afterwards. And 15. it's nothing that's going to hurt her. Um, um, so you, may, you, so you haven't talked to her about this at all? I haven't, but I'm sure it'll be okay. I've known yeah. her since she was a teenager. And I, if it's I, saline, it's not going to do any good, in, any harm. And if it's solumedrol, I mean, years ago when we had nothing else to give, we used to give patients Phenergan and dexamethasone. So yeah. you know, I'm sure it'll be yeah. fine. So, but the protocol of the study is to give it before she's closed, and I'm just about ready to close. So if you could just go ahead and push it, then oh. we can get out of here. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I think I, I do have a problem with that. Why? Yeah, it's well, since patient hasn't signed any consent forms that notify, it's constitute can constitute a violation of I, IRB as well as. Well, but you let me worry about that. I, I've uh, known her forever, and I think that it really may help her. And yeah. So I really like her on the study. And yeah. I've known her since she was 16. I've just done yeah. her first pelvic and seen her through her married life. Oh, so you did her first did pelvic. Her first pelvic, first pelvic, first baby. So, um, so why don't you just go ahead and give it? Well, I, I cannot give it because I do. I think there's a. I do think that's probably an important issue needs to be worked out before all this happened. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, so 
there are at least three things that I notice about this interaction. First, English was not his native language, so he had that added barrier to speaking up. Despite that, good for him, he held his own and he stuck up for the patient, even with a very fast talking and persistent OB. That was not easy. We wanted to be able to measure the quality of speaking up and how it might be improved by our teaching. Um, so we had to develop a scale to rate the language. And this is a five point scale that we came up with. You got a one for saying nothing at all, two for uttering something oblique, like really, uh, three was for saying some kind of advocacy or inquiry once, uh, like I'm concerned about doing this or I'm uncomfortable about not having consent. Four was for repeated advocacy or inquiry or effective initiation of a discussion. And actually, I would like to argue that whether or not you use advocacy inquiry or another type of language rubric, um, it's really the starting of a discussion, which is our ultimate goal, actually. And then five was, was reserved for crisp advocacy inquiry. I'm concerned about really knowing and protecting the patient's wishes. Can we stop and think this through? So using this scale, um, how was the impact of our teaching intervention? We broke down the data based on the role group that this trainee was speaking up to, either faculty anesthesiologists, faculty surgeons, or circulating nurses. The numbers represent the mean speaking up score either before teaching or after teaching. The quality of language when speaking up to anesthesiologists increased from 2.3 to 3.6. This was statistically significant. Um, when speaking up to surgeons, the mean language from trainees increased from 3.1 to 3.9. This was statistically significant. And initially I was surprised that it'd be harder to speak up to anesthesiologists, you know, within our own group than to surgeons who are people outside our close group. Um, and we wonder if the actions in the simulated OR might have impact, been act, impacted by social norms from our real life. Uh, for example, could there be some inherent reluctance to challenge a parent figure or a paternalistic teacher figure um, or a reluctance to stir up trouble with superiors who might influence our reputation or grading on rotations, for example? We just really can't be sure. The most surprising thing for me really was the results of speaking up to circulating nurses shown in the bottom row, row all super low scores. So why weren't we speaking up to, um, to nurses uh, and, and also see that there was no improvement after debriefing? This was very puzzling, but during debriefing with the trainees, we uncovered two very concerning issues. One, that some trainees were really not paying attention or necessarily caring about what the nurses were doing. And two, that some trainees didn't necessarily see the nurses as a valuable resource when the patient was deteriorating. So of course we all know what that um, we certainly want a great circulating nurse by your side when things go wrong. So in this way, simulation and debriefing was a technique to expose learning gaps and direct targeted teaching to specific needs. Also, let's take a back and look at uh, take a step back and look at the numbers. These are all low scores across the board. Even when they knew they were expected to speak up in the follow-up scenario, they still had low scores. Speaking up is so difficult to do, even when you know you should. So this made us feel that the challenges to speaking up are deeply embedded in us and made us feel all the more strongly that simulation should be used uh, to provide a safe environment for practice. So whenever we uh, teach something or make a change, we hope that the benefits are sustainable. We sought to measure the retention of simulation-based learning and how well it could be transferred to different settings. So two years later, we recontacted some of the trainees to engage them in a follow-up exercise to measure their speaking up skills. At this point, many of them had graduated from their training and were scattered around our country. So the follow-up exercise was performed with a primitive virtual setup. Um, and mind you, this was all done prior to Zoom and other formats with which we're very familiar now. So in retrospect, it feels a little bit clunky and primitive. Okay, so here is an interactive uh, invitation for you right now, all of you participating in this APSS programming. Um, you will get a chance to experience the exercise the way that our participants did. So imagine you and I, you and I are on the phone together while on the phone with me, you sit in front of your computer and you go to a secure website. 
where there are different videos and they play when different tabs are, text, are, are checked, like um, on the screen. So pretend that you're a participant now. And uh, what I would say to you is imagine you're in an OR working with the person in the video. A situation will unfold and the colleague in the video will make some requests of you. Then when the screen goes black, you can talk to me on the phone to continue the conversation as if we were standing together still in the operating room. Ready? Okay, so let's try this. Listen, great. I'm glad you're back. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, so while you were gone, let me tell you what happened. I brought that other patient to recovery. She's fine. And then we had to come rushing back with this new patient. Thank God the spinal went in right away and everything's okay now. Everything okay? Yeah. yeah okay. So um, listen, I need your help. I gave that last patient three milligrams of Doramorph. Can you just go to recovery and initial on the chart that you witnessed that I wasted the rest of it? Okay, so does everyone understand the situation? I'm asking the trainee to witness that they saw something that they really didn't. Um, in a minute, I'm going to play some of the responses I got. And before I do, let me know, let me just say that no matter what they said, I would say something back to them so that they would always have two chances to challenge me. So it's really the two challenge rule. And I, right now I actually have to ask you to bear with me because I'm gonna play some audio, uh, some recordings, but I am not actually able to um, hear them. So hopefully uh, this will all go okay. So here's the first answer. Um, if you could just initial that you wasted it, that'd be awesome, thanks. Okay. Um, so you know where the recovery room is. Okay, so. Um, okay, great, thanks. So there was no challenge and he would get a score out of a uh, score of one on our scale, right? So the next one speaks up, but not in a collaborative problem solving way. So oh, um, help me out here and just go sign as a witness, okay? I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, but we do it all the time, right? Yeah, but that's not right. I, I can find somebody else to do it, I can't do that. Oh, all right, I guess you're right. Um, thanks anyway. Joyce, I don't know if you're able to tell me if that one is all done. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, hopefully play the third one uh, where this person really struggles to have this discussion. But if you listen very closely to her choice of words, she, she does use advocacy inquiry and strengthens her argument by expressing her own personal discomfort about what's going on. Just, if you don't mind, just going, you know, to the room and witnessing that um, waste for me, that'd be great. So, so I totally hear you, May, May that uh, you didn't have anyone around uh, when you wasted, um, but I'm, I'm uncomfortable with finding that I saw something I didn't actually see. Um, what do you what do you think we maybe could write to make everyone feel more comfortable? Well, we we do this all the time, right? Certainly, there definitely definitely people will will uh, sign things when when they didn't see it, but I'm really not feeling comfortable. Okay, so let's see the results of the retention and transferability of these uh, speaking up lessons when they were given two years earlier. I'll walk you through the um, results. So moving from left to right, 
First, all the speaking up challenges were made towards attending anesthesiologists in this video only. There were no surgeons and nurses. Of the original 40 people that participated in the first study, only 15 could be con contacted two years later. All those that were contacted agreed to participate in the follow-up study. The next two columns show how this subset of 15 people did previously, two years earlier, before and after the lesson about speaking up. You can see that previously their baseline mean score of 2.6 improved to 3.2. When these people participated in the follow-up study, their mean score was 2.9, so better than their baseline language prior to training, but reflecting a decrement of performance in the intervening two years. There was, of course, an important confounder that these clinicians with two years more of clinical experience under their belts would naturally be better at speaking up than they were two years earlier. Thus, we recruited a control group to participate in the virtual video exercise. These control trainees were matched in terms of, year of years of training and were specifically selected from institutions where there were strong uh, simulation programs. Thus, they were comfortable with simulation and comfortable with role play, but they had not undergone the specific training on uh, speaking up. There is still a problem, though, comparing this experimental group with the control group um, in that you may remember in our previous analysis, a perfect score of five was given if participants used crisp advocacy inquiry language. Now, there would be no way to expect our control group to use crisp advocacy inquiry language since they hadn't undergone that training. So we reanalyzed re the performance data using a four-point scale instead of a five-point scale. And for those from our original experimental group, any previous score of four, of four or five would now be graded as a four. And in this way, our experimental group had a new virtual mean score of 2.8. The control group had a determined mean score of 2.3. And with an a priori larger sample size of 45 in the control group, this difference was found to be statistically significant. So there's a small measurable effect that persists after two years. But again, the overall scores are so low, speaking up is so difficult. I'm just going to wrap up by uh, talking about a, another speaking up study we did with grown-ups with anesthesia faculty. We analyzed the performance of 340 faculty members who were enrolled as participants in a, in a simulation-based uh, training session. They were pretty senior with an average of 16 years of independent experience, and they, presented, they were presented with various opportunities to speak up in the simulated OR, for example, because of a sleepy surgeon, there was uh, an inappropriate upsetting conversation that might be overheard by an awake patient, and an inappropriate clinical management of a venous air embolus. The educational intervention was set up as a randomized controlled trial in that half the participants were taught about speaking up, and uh, they were taught about advocacy inquiry before the scenario, and the other half of the participants were not. The sad news is that there was no difference um, in speaking up by either of the two groups, that this, uh, the intervention group and the control group both did poorly um, and the practicing did not make a difference. So that being said, the productive part of the study came through the debriefing conversations after the scenarios where we discussed um, speaking up with these attendings and we asked participants to draw ideas from real life uh, where communication was difficult. And with thematic analysis, we were able to identify both hurdles and enablers to speaking up. So having uncertainty about the issue, stereotypes about others in the room. For example, uh, you know, I heard Dr. Smith yell at his fellow. He probably doesn't want to hear from me now. Familiarity, um, like we like each other. His plan isn't what I probably would have chosen to do, but okay, let's try it and let's try it out. Um, respect for experience. The older they are, I'm sure they, they know more than me and expected repercussions. I don't want them to like me. I don't want to be a, a source of alarm. And what if I'm wrong? I don't want to look stupid. Similar themes that were enabling, uh, were realizing the problem and having real certainty about it. Having a rubric, it feels easier if we thought about and we've planned how we're going to speak up. Certainty about the consequence. You know, I definitely saw this happen. I'm sure there's potential harm to the patient. Familiarity, again, shows up in both columns. So in this instance, uh, I know Joe, I like him a lot. I can speak up to him because I feel like I'm helping him. And if I'm wrong, it's okay, he'll still like me. There's less of a sense of personal risk. 
And finally, having a second opinion, having a partner gives courage in these moments. So in conclusion, these enablers are important to help enable ourselves, but also to enable others. Going through the right hand list again, um, through more open communication, we can identify problems, we can use rubrics and hear others when they're trying to speak up. We can add to the group's certainty about risk. We can leverage our familiarity to speak up without fear of harm. And we can each be that second person uh, to help negotiate through an impasse. And I just wanted to make the point that trust is important. We know that human relationships are complex and it's really not just about speaking and listening, but really having good trust as well. Uh, we're doing a, a study now supported by the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, and we look forward to sharing our analyzed data at future meetings. But in the meantime, we know that trust is important for relationships, and this, it, this does impact our performance and our wellness. So um, as shown in the left, there are costs to performance and wellness when trust is lacking, worsening performance on individuals' tasks, adherence to safety protocols, and team performance all take, take a hit. In terms of wellness, lack of trust uh, hurts worker morale and increases worker disability and workforce turnover. During the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we learned how importantly positive social con uh, connections can connect us and, and impact us. Challenges could not be met through the efforts of just individuals. Uh, many workers experienced a sense of moral distress trying to maintain high professional standards in the setting of limited resources and workers. And in our own hospital, the establishment of a peer support program was critically important to address these needs. We know that social supports improve resiliency, decrease clinician uh, burnout. They also increase job satisfaction and, and um, engagement, self-efficacy and innovation. They increase courage and gratitude. And we've become very interested in this so-called relational coordination. Uh, relational coordination has two important ingredients, high quality communication and high quality relationships. So high quality communication is frequent, timely, accurate, and problem solving. High quality relationships are shared goals, shared knowledge, and mutual respect. And isn't that exactly what you want when managing a critically ill patient or evolving critical situation? Um, so I'd like, this is my last slide, I'd like to invite you to think about these communication skills and competencies as ways to develop our leadership skills um, in anesthetizing locations and in our research areas. When I think of leadership, I don't think of a pyramid shape with one leader at the top or at the peak of the, of the shape, but rather I encourage you to think about leadership as having influence because in that influence model, we can all have influence on each other, no matter where we are in the pyramid. And I encourage you to speak up, to enable others to speak up, to invite others to speak up, and to value speaking up. Um, weaving, speaking up, and building trust into our work uh, is critically important. It's a work and life competency. It's good for our patients. It's good for ourselves. Thank you so much.